How many urgent announcements have you learned to overlook in your life? Let me give you, give you a few examples. Maybe it was in an email that you got. This was a thing more a few years ago, but maybe it was from a man supposedly from Nigeria. Of course, he was the son of the former prime minister of the country. And he just has to process a couple million dollars through your bank account. All he needs is all your bank account numbers, your social security, et cetera, and it'll be good. I think we know an urgent plea like that is best deleted. Or maybe it's at the department store. They've got the big signs out front that say, two days only, lowest prices of the season. But you know, if you don't get in there in these two days, another couple weeks, there's probably going to be a new season with even lower prices. Or maybe it's on TV. There's a commercial warning you about the dangers of the bacteria that could live on your kitchen counter. But it can only be solved with this one specific cleaning product. Somehow, even if we ignore all of these urgent pleas, life just goes on. And our lives aren't really affected by it. Maybe that's because again and again, we see the truth of that old proverb coming true. That the urgent is seldom important and the important is seldom urgent. But have we grown perhaps a bit calloused to an urgent plea that does matter? An urgent plea that is really more important than any other. An urgent plea that is so important that in our last chapter of inspired scripture, we hear it repeated by our Lord Jesus three times. Do you hear the urgency in our Lord's voice? as he says three times in Revelation 22, I am coming soon. What is it about these words that make them so easy to ignore and miss the urgency behind them? Is it perhaps because the urgency is blunted because he's seemed to delay for so long? I mean, it has been about 2,000 years since John put Jesus' words to ink. Have we begun to believe the words of the scoffers that Peter talked about in his second epistle. Scoffers that would come in the last days saying, where is this coming, he promised. Have previous generations of Christians been foolish to live every day in anticipation of that last Easter day when Jesus would call those out of their graves to come out? Oh, our sinful nature loves to raise that voice of question in our hearts to lead us to believe that one day, will simply follow the next and the next as life goes on without end. But when our hearts tempt us to think this way and grow careless, listen carefully to Jesus' words. Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. As these names Jesus uses for himself, Jesus speaks with the authority of the Almighty God. With each of these three pairs of terms, Jesus is using terms we've heard elsewhere in Scripture to emphasize the eternity of God. Well, yes, Jesus is always our brother who took on our flesh and, blo flesh and blood. He, at the same time, is also true and eternal God. And when he appears on that second great Easter day, all who have ever lived are going to need to stand before him and give account for their lives. He tells us that his reward is with him and that he was going to give everyone according to what he has done. Jesus then goes on to expand on that a bit more. He says, Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are the, are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. There is the verdict that is going to be pronounced as everyone is gathered before him. Either everyone's going to be part, either people will be part of those who are blessed and able to enter the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, or those who are outside, among the dogs. Now when scripture speaks of dogs here, don't think of your faithful house pet or that loyal hunting dog. 
Rather, the word for dogs used here is that word rather for those mangy, emaciated, disease-ridden strays that run free. These are like the kind of dogs I got to see when I was in St. Lucia a few years ago on a mission trip. These are dogs that respond to no master's voice and run in freedom until their freedom kills them. This is the picture that Scripture uses to describe unbelief. And this dog-like existence is even further explained in the verses that follow. Those who practice magic arts, the sorcerers, the adulterers, the murderers, the idolaters, all of which Jesus continues to sum up again with this simple phrase, everyone who loves and practices falsehood. You see, every sin is falsehood because every sin follows that basic satanic lie that God is not the ultimate source of goodness and that his ways are not right, but rather that happiness and contentment can be found in other things than serving faithfully our Creator. It tells us all such dogs will find themselves outside, eternally outside that city that God has prepared for his own. And Jesus tells us elsewhere that outside there is nothing but darkness, weeping, and gnashing of teeth. But we skipped over those who will be able to enter the city. Obviously, this must be those who do the opposite of what the dogs will stand guilty of doing. Right? Wrong. If that was the case, none of us could stand and God's holy city would forever only have God dwelling in it. But notice what Jesus did say. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. What have those done who are ready to enter God's holy city when Christ returns? In this life, they have washed their robes. This is the only way to enter God's holy city. Because remember, in God's book, every lustful thought is already adultery and every hateful thought is already murder. And every one of us was born with a sinful nature that wants to do the opposite of God's will, as dog-like as anyone's. But those who are ready to enter the city have been washed of all that should have kept them out in the first place. And washed in what? You know. In Revelation 7, almost this exact same phrasing is used. Only this time, it's not describing those ready to enter the kingdom of heaven, but rather those already there. These in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. There is only one way to enter that holy city and finally taste of that tree of life once lost in the Garden of Eden. It's to have our dog-like record washed away by the blood of Christ. That's what makes Jesus' message an urgent plea so urgent. The Christian, those who in faith in this life, death and resurrection, in Jesus' life, death and resurrection, and are prepared for him by daily washing their robes and ready, they will be able to receive him with joy on his return and be welcomed by him into his eternal city. But those who are not prepared and those who remain as they are by nature, wild dogs who run from their creator, will find themselves outside forever. And that is why, in response to Jesus' urgent warning, the Christian church makes an urgent plea. As Jesus speaks the promise of his return, did you see in this lesson how his people respond? The Spirit and the Bride, that is the church, say, Come, and let him who hears say, Come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. The church is pictured here with perhaps her most beautiful name. She is the Bride of Christ, the Bride of the Heavenly Bridegroom Jesus. As the church takes to heart the certainty of Jesus' promise, the Holy Spirit who lives in the heart of God's people leads them through faith to cry out before the world an urgent plea of their own. Come! The church cries out this plea to the world to recognize 
and they, that they can know that they have been washed clean in the blood of the Lamb and will be able to enter the city of God forever because of that. It is an urgent plea that can be sent out to all those who the sins of this life have left thirsty for forgiveness, whose sins of this life have left them for answers that they can't answer themselves. And that is why the church cries out with an urgent plea, come, find God's salvation. And whom do we mean by the world to whom this plea goes out? Well, first it starts with ourselves. It is a reminder to each of us to run daily from the sins of the heart and life that want us to return again to what we were by nature. Dogs running free from the protection and grace and mercy of our Lord. That's why we come back again and again to the life-giving salvation that our Lord gives and the grace He gives in word and sacraments. There we daily wash our robes in the blood of Christ and make them white. And our plea goes out to fellow Christians, our church family. Come, we say to them, join us in turning daily from the sin that wants to entangle us all. Come, join us in returning to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. And finally, our plea is directed to those who don't yet know him, the unbelievers. We, we want to let them know what's the only thing that can satisfy the thirst of their souls and answer for that sin in their lives. Before the last day dawns, we'll continue to speak our urgent plea to the world. Come. But our Lord's promise leads us to speak that urgent plea in yet one more direction. Listen to what the church says as our Lord repeats his promise one last time. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Did you hear what John answers for all of us as Jesus speaks these urgent words of promise one last time? John speaks for all of us. And it's not a plea to the world this time, but it's to Jesus himself. It's a plea to Jesus to keep and fulfill his promise. It's a plea for our Lord to return again in glory. It is a plea for him to put an end to this sin and all the harm it does to us. It is a plea for our risen Savior to bring that second Easter day where death is put to an end and along with it all the crying and mourning and pain that it brings. It is the plea of the bride that the wedding day may come and that his heaven, her heavenly bridegroom takes her to be with her, him forever in his heavenly home. It is the plea of all of us who are washing our robes day after day that one day we reach that day where that task is no longer necessary as we are eternally clothed in the finery of Christ's perfection with, never, with sin never to mar its beauty again. And so... With that plea of the church for the return of her Lord, the final page of Scripture comes to its close. Until the last day, a double plea will continue to arise from God's people. A plea that says to the world, come, wash your robes in the blood of the Lamb. And a plea that goes out to her Savior, saying, come, Lord Jesus, quickly in glory. Both pleas of God's church are inspired by one single promise of her Lord. Yes, I am coming soon. To that we respond, Come, all you who are thirsty, and come, Lord Jesus. Amen.